What's going on everyone? Welcome to another podcast. Today we've got a lot to talk about. We have Patreon, which updated its new terms and conditions. We have uh, Pixiv, which is also related to PayPal and Gamroad. And we have the new game that just dropped, Code Bakery, to talk about. So let's start with Patreon. Patreon updated its terms and conditions. They basically demand that uh, fictional characters, okay, just keep this in mind, fictional characters need to give consent. Just imagine how ridiculous this is. We have uh, our guest here, Alex, to also comment on this. Alex? Yep, I'm here. So, about the, the Patreon business, we have heard news from people that use Patreon as content creators that they have received notifications from Patreon that their uh, drawings, especially the ones related to bondage, have been flagged as non-consensual. So, what does this entail? Essentially, if you have a fictional character being strapped onto a machine or maybe using latex or something like that, those characters are no longer accepted uh, to be drawn like that because Patreon assumes that there's no clear distinction between consensual relations or consensual activities and non-consensual. So we have an example from an artist, which we can't show, obviously, <laughs> that basically had a, a girl trapped to a machine doing kind of activities that you're probably guessing. And Patreon complained that the drawing was non-consensual. Basically, there was no way of saying that the character was having a consensual activity. So what the artist did was he drew a bubble over a bubble of speech over the drawing saying, I am consenting with this, with the face of the character in a sense. <laughs> and Patreon still responded saying, you know what? This is not enough. This is not enough for us. Consider it. Yeah, we've got uh, an example of uh, the message here. Yeah, uh, I don't know if this is the, the one that you're referring to. It is specifically this artist. This mm -hmm. is the message that they got from uh, Patreon about what... Uh, uh, this about is from uh, artist uh, Grilled Fox. And basically the artist contacted uh, Patreon uh, about this topic. Obviously uh, concerned about all these new terms and conditions update because I know it's going to, to affect a lot of people. And Patreon's response was kind of vague as you can imagine when it comes to this so part of the content they are okay with it uh, another part they have pros with it and they say so i took a look at your twitter page and i wanted to let you know that some of the content contains contrasting elements that place some of the content in violation of our guidelines maybe to provide more guidance Although all characters appear to be adults, some of the characters are young looking enough that they aren't unmistakably perceived as adults. Okay, this is another problem, which is they are assuming the age of the characters. It's not enough for you to draw a character that uh, on the bio will say it's uh, 18 plus years old. If they're young looking, they can just say, nah, nah, you know what? We consider it underage. Another example, how they're not unmistakably adult. And about the claims, I noticed that you uh, include these claims in uh, several sections of your page stating all characters are consenting adults, which is definitely a step in the right direction. However, please keep in mind that if we notice any visual elements in the content that contradict this disclaimer, such as the presence of significant signs of restraint and distress, uh, which, by the way, it's called Damsel in Distress, uh, which exists in uh, many classic movies. So, are we going to see them going after classic movies next? Well, I think when they talk about distress, they're talking about characters in stressful situations, whether mm -hmm. consensual or not, that they might be, um, you know, fearing for something. Like, if a character is yeah. holding some, some kind of tool or something that might be like overwhelmingly scary for the character in question uh patreon can still claim that it's against the guideline yeah exactly like the classic damsel in distress that 
is so in uh, 70s and 80s cartoons the damsel tied to the train tracks i mean by what i'm reading that won't be allowed anymore which is ridiculous we had that on 70s 80s 90s cartoons and there was no issue with that because we knew okay this, these are fictional characters and even when when they're not fictional you even have that in movies because they're actors this makes no sense to me concept yeah, might but... become unclear in existence and this could uh, place content in village so th they basically they're going to be the ones assuming if the situations that uh, you're putting your fictional character in they're assuming <laughs> if if they consent to it this i don't know how this uh, came to anyone's mind uh, I don't know what they were thinking when they wrote this. This makes no sense. Yeah, yeah, what do you think, Alex? Well, if you look at some of the images that are in this specific example, which obviously we can't show. Yeah, we can't. <laughs> yeah. It seems very explicit to me that the, even if you didn't tell the age of the character, that you would assume it's an adult. Mm -hmm. Like the character has developed body, has developed breast, have a childish face. So... The fact that Patreon assumes that a character isn't an adult just based on the fact that there isn't enough information, it makes you wonder what would Patreon accept as a as a clear-cut uh, definition of an adult. Apparently nothing, because I've already seen examples where the artist states on the bio of the character uh, that the, the character is an adult, and even that is not enough to, to Patreon. How crazy is this? Sure, like, this will be the, the equivalent of, of like uh, you're going to the casino they ask you for your id you show the id and they're like you know what nah uh, we're looking at you and, and it, it's the same as the id it's clearly the same but we don't believe this it's yeah, it's completely I don't, know, I don't know if you're familiar with the monogatari series i am uh, familiar with it i haven't watched it yeah the only issue i have with this when you're talking about uh, an explicit uh, statement of age is that you can mm -hmm. have a character like Shinobu, which is like a, a a vampire that looks like she's ten years old. Oh, uh, I know. Okay, I know the classic example. Years old. Mm -hmm. She's six hundred years, years old. So saying in the bio that character has a fictional, like even if it it looks like a child, it has like a really high age. Mm -hmm. I can understand if Patreon is not okay with that. But also, mm -hmm. at the same time, you have to accept that it's now Patreon dictating what is considered good or not. Like, it's them who's considering whether the character is viable, or, which, is bring, which brings another can of worms to the table, you think? Yeah, it is. Because at this point, you can't say, like, you can have any kind of character, and it can be, like, some big TD anime girl that is obviously over the age of consent, mm -hmm. and they can, they can consider it underage. Or that it doesn't look adult enough so it really makes you wonder where do you draw the line like what can you specifically write down that makes it so that you can actually draw these characters you know what i mean yeah i think that's that you can't really objectively point out what makes it look like this or like that because people will always say look this obviously looks like a child which is fair obviously but where do you draw the line like where do you write it down what characteristics would make it so that it's not the case. And I think that's the issue. Patreon is not being clear with what they want the artist. So they want the artist to say, okay, I consent, but how do you show consent? So the this artist in specific started putting stickers on the drawing saying, I mm -hmm. consent, but still for Patreon, that's not enough. So what is? What is enough consent? Apparently nothing. They, and they go on, uh, both of the examples I linked above display tears and signs of distress. Again, which is typical damsel in distress, and this wasn't a problem till now, because it was at um, artists of damsel in distress. Again, th these are fictional characters, yeah, and you know, although one of them contains a speech bubble stating "I consent," this contradicts the amount of non-consensual visual elements 
in the content placing it uh, still in violation of our guidelines so we can only assume that uh, the person that wrote this never saw uh, any kind of uh, damsel in distress roleplay or it's, anything it's remotely just, similar it's not just that i think that what patreon has an issue with this at least this particular employee has an issue with mm -hmm. is that the content in, content in, in that we're talking about shows bonded uh, right. And even though it's only one person alone, so there's no one acting but the person in this case, they're using a machine to give them pleasure mm -hmm. that they themselves are controlling, and it considers that it's not, not enough consent. Th th that's crazy. Because, and the reason they give it is that she has tears in her eyes, which is a con common trope when you talk yeah, exactly. about non-safe for work art. It, it's very common, especially in, in, in Japanese drawings, to have the, mm -hmm. the girl or even the boy crying while they're, act, they're having the act. Uh, I don't think it's something that shows that they're not showing consent. I think this the problem here is that this is being acted upon uh, by the employee of Patreon that decided these things on their own. Yeah, absolutely. It is insane when you even describe like, the, the whole situation where she's controlling the machine and Patron is still deciding that no, the, there's no consent. Yeah, but she's controlling the, the, the machine. What else do you need? Like, uh, where do you draw the line? You, you draw the line immediately at, uh, at the sign of tears? Yeah, eventually you just, at some point you'll have, you'll have a character like touching themselves or something alone in a room alone and because she has tears in her eyes it's now uh, non-consensual yeah but, like, but then like again they they give uh, they give another another example for contrast here's an example taken from your uh, content with similar themes but where consent is much clearer since although the character is still restrained uh, so the, the character is still restrained on both but mm. the facial expressions body language and heart and speech bubbles all support the fact but again you want a, a more clear speech bubble than a bubble with two words i consent it makes yeah. no sense yeah they, and they kind of contradict that i think there's a bigger problem with this which is the fact that at this point you're basically forcing the artist to change their art to fit yeah fit your specific guidelines which make no sense in our heart to to even pinpoint exactly what they want you to do uh because even in the example they give that it's good i can imagine that by the same parameters they use just because they say the character is resta restrained that's enough for them to ban the image like there's no clear way to say okay i'm gonna make this drawing mm -hmm. and i am free to make it without any punishment because there's no clear guideline there's nothing that tells you specifically you can do this you can't do that and to me it also means that just the fact that they're saying oh the facial expression must be like this the body language must be like that the heart the speech okay so what if this character had a mask is the consent suddenly not explicit because you can't see the facial expression so that probably you can't draw a character with a mask probably so what if the character doesn't speak what if the character doesn't show emotion even though like i can imagine a series of imagine that you have a robot can a robot consent i mean you're gonna need the, the consent from that robot okay but what if the robot is not capable of consent because they're just machine and don't have an advanced ai it's gonna be banned absolutely and i feel like this is where you come into issues is that is that you don't have a clear way of defining what is acceptable or not and this is very weird because we see a lot of specifically i mean obviously this happens with men as well but there's specifically a lot of women online like especially on twitter and they have their own pages with the links to every kind of content that mm -hmm. is explicit that you can see these people these people are real right you're not right sex actors they're people that just take pictures of themselves and put it online for others to see and for people to pay money for they're denigrating their own personal image to get money which is mm -hmm. essentially what's happened uh and no one has a problem with this but suddenly you pick up fictional characters that are drawn and now it's an issue even though 
throughout the ages, it has been very clear that you cannot control art the same way you control real life. You cannot just ban anything from art and think that it's acceptable in any way, because art is art, regardless of what it is. I mean, you have historical examples where every time that uh, you had art being banned, it was always the, the people on the wrong side of history doing it. Exactly. So and if I, anything, I only, a, only supports more um, what we're talking about. Yeah, I have an, a clear example of this, which was, I believe it was when the, the leaders of Qatar or maybe uh, Saudi Arabia, they, they went to France and the, the French president, Macron, ordered that all the statues of like the, the Greek looking statues uh, mm -hmm. would have their genitals covered up because they didn't. Oh, I remember want that. Offend. They didn't want to offend the sensibilities of the people from other countries, which is really weird, right? Because it's yeah, just hard. exactly. It's still just, and they're the ones coming to your country. And for me, I'm not sure where this is coming from, but this feels like it's trying to appeal to someone in specific. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if this is all the oil money invested in all of this because big tech companies have a lot of money coming from Saudi Arabia and other rich that is true. countries. I have no idea where this is coming from, but there's the fact that PayPal in specific, which which are the ones taking issues with these things, and that's why Patreon is being so careful and trying to take these things down, is because they don't want to have issues with their paying partner. They don't want to have issues with MasterCard, Visa, they don't want to have issues mm -hmm. with PayPal. And this is where this is where it's coming from, because as you can imagine, Patreon is making money with this. So they don't have a direct incentive to ban art on Patreon unless right. they had an ul ulterior motive. What do you think about that? I think it might be onto something. And uh, let's not forget that PayPal, over the, the last years, they've been uh, consistently doing stupid crap on top of stupid crap. They've been um, attacking conservatives, blocking payments to conservatives. Many people will say that they are right here, but don't forget that this can happen to you. Uh, another case, which well, I know it's already, it... happen it's already happening to left wing content creators, too, because most of these arts that is are, true. Yeah, are, are LGBT plus. Mm -hmm. And I feel like when you're trying to ban this kind of art, you are doing a disservice to these people because now they lost their livelihood. A lot of artists that consider themselves social activists uh, and they're also getting affected by this. Like a lot of them yeah. are starting to have issues because maybe they draw uh, non-conforming art or something like that. Uh, and suddenly they're being put under these brackets. They're going through the same issues that regular artists are having. Mm -hmm. So regardless of your, of your you know, sexuality or, or your uh, party affiliation or whatever, uh, everyone is having this issue with Patreon. Exactly. That's a big issue because for a lot of these people, this, this this is their livelihood. Like they stopped working nine to five jobs so they could be able to draw online. And people pay them because there's no one else drawing the same thing. Why PayPal you... has been um, has been cutting payments to uh, to a lot of groups, a lot of groups. Uh, another example that that I could also mention will be uh, in Russia where they, they stopped uh, PayPal payments, which, okay, you can say, yeah, it, it's about the war and, and all of that, but every time there's a war, we also have uh, to consider that there's going to be uh, a lot of innocent people affected. But the, the real question is, do you consider every Russian a terrorist? Of course not. So why would you ban these people from making money? Exactly, it's what I'm saying. So... If you think that you're changing the war or you're affecting the country, these countries are very low, low barrel. Like they, they don't care if they're uh, destroying the human rights to be able to make a, a living, still be able to support their economy. The ones exactly. that are going to pay from the, for this are the citizens. Right, so, and um, and a lot of people will completely agree with you on that, and say, "Oh, Putin doesn't care about its citizens." Okay. And now you're pretending that this will affect him when you're targeting the citizens? Well, I think uh, when, people, when people make that argument, they make the argument that the Russians should have some responsibility over the leadership that their country 
mm-hmm. but in reality we know that this is not that linear yeah it's right? not because if you have half the country accepting putin and you have the other half not accepting them what are they reasonably going to do short of starting a civil war yeah and let me ask you something are you willing to pick up a gun start a civil war alone in your country probably not yeah so why would you assume that a russian would do that exactly so that's my issue with it because you know the ukrainians started that and it started a lot of issues in their country like ukraine straight up picked up arms Mm -hmm. take down their government and that's how this entire war started so the russians intervened and they shouldn't have intervened that's fair i think that too uh but you can't ex- you can't expect everyone to just not agree with their the government in starting a war because not even that doesn't happen anywhere else it doesn't happen in Europe it doesn't happen in America but it's both America and Europe that are thinking that ah oh, Russians should, should revolt take down Putin that's not going to happen historically in Russia that happened with the Tsars maybe 100 years ago that's a, as far back as you can go Yeah, and then people will say, oh, but these people voted for Putin. And then, uh, like a minute later, they will say, yeah, but elections are not free. So, which one is it? These people yes. voted for Putin, but the elections are not free. So, I feel like there's a, a lot of confusion on people's heads. They're just trying to blame the normal citizens for for it. Yeah, uh, my position I, when it comes to this is it's pretty clear. I'm always on the side of the innocents that are being affected on both sides. And look, I personally knew a few Russians that didn't agree with Putin. And mm-hmm. I knew them personally. And they owned business. And they owned international business. And they only wanted to to make their living. And they, they didn't want to be involved with politics. Obviously, this war has had a big impact on their lives. But they're not personally responsible for it. They never agreed with this. They didn't of course. vote for Putin. So why should they take the short end stick? Yeah, it makes no sense. It makes no sense that you would hold every single citizen of your country responsible for what your government is doing. Because that's not how any any other place in the world works. Mm-hmm. Unless that you want to say that every leftist is responsible for Donald Trump in America. Or that every left <laughs> is responsible for the right being extremists in Europe. Like, that's not how it works. Indeed. Or vice versa. Like, it, it doesn't make any sense. And I don't know why PayPal is doing this. I don't know. It... Yeah, it, it's not it's not Putin that, that is going on Patreon and is like, Damn it! I can't use PayPal! God damn it! I have a theory that this might be associated with the ESG guideline. The ESG guideline? Yeah, the ESG. So ESG is basically, uh, what do I say? It's a bunch of parameters that dictate how your company should be run. It's basically mm-hmm. short for environmental, social, and government. And oh, right. Basically, okay, okay. Yeah, they basically enforce a bunch of, uh, well, they soft enforce a bunch of uh, uh parameters that your company has to follow to be able to be publicly quoted in some of their index and if you compile uh, if you comply with this request you can basically have an investment investment boost companies doing it and this might be the reason why paypal is doing it but i also have a feeling that it might have to do with where the money from the investors come. maybe some big investors are not in favor of this kind of art online Maybe they're trying to enforce ESG because they really believe it's mm-hmm. what the, the world needs. But this is having repercussions in places that are not making changes. So if you stop, what do you seriously believe will happen if you start to enforce these politics, for example, on Patreon? Everyone is just going to start using AI generation, start making their own art. You're not going to stop explicit art from existing, even if you remove the artist from the... Mm-hmm. And... So I don't see the point. Well, I think a lot of people will uh, search for another provider, uh, like uh, Subscribestar, probably. Yeah, because you already have a series of alternatives to Patreon. And it's only a matter of where the market goes, where the economy goes. So these are already relatively niche artists, right? You don't have mm-hmm. maybe more than a thousand people or maybe a hundred people subscribe to them. So if, the, if this artist changes elsewhere, I don't think those 100 people are going to have a problem paying elsewhere. Yeah. 
that's just the free market working exactly especially because yeah. a lot of these artists already have uh, uh, multiple uh, options when it comes to to payment indeed indeed and maybe eventually they just start running their own discord server and yeah. just starting uh giving people roles basically there and just asking for donation and mm -hmm. paypal can't control that because paypal doesn't know specifically where the money comes from or why it's there exactly yeah and then we have the example of other websites now that are also having the same issue like pixip i believe issue. that the reason why patreon is doing this is the same reason why pixip for example is canceling their paypal partnership mm -hmm. so basically paypal has decided that it doesn't want to allow for for payments for r18 rated art pixip so what they did was they gave pixip an ultimatum you either remove the adult art or you stop having paypal payment and pixip went with okay then we'll stop having paypal payment <laughs> Um, the issue is again there's a lot of this uh, sorry uh, let me just say this yeah, I think they stopped right. payment uh, but only for the R18 and not uh, completely yeah that's true that's true so basically you can still pay for for non-adult uh, yeah. uh, artwork but you can't pay for adult art and I have no idea why this is being enforced because again I, I do believe this is related to Patreon and I do think that Patreon is it's possible these artworks because they're getting pressure from the payment we had a similar thing happening a while back with Pornhub I don't know if you remember this but basically Pornhub had to stop their membership with MasterCard and PayPal because um, PayPal and MasterCard didn't want to be part of the I think I remember at least hearing about MasterCard and not sure about uh, PayPal yeah but PayPal is go it has gone and the reason they gave back then is that there's a lot of material in, in Pornhub that can't be mm -hmm. oversighted like you can't just review every single movie so there was a chance that maybe right. there was non-consensual videos in there which is a, which is a legitimate uh, uh, that, that, that it is yeah yeah which is a legitimate, legitimate there have been a legitimate concern uh, legitimate, sorry legitimate uh, concerns uh, about that in uh, in recent years and I do believe that the reason why PayPal and why Patreon and Pixiv are going this way is for the same reason. Now, I would be okay with that if Patreon and Pixiv were hosting uh, real people in non-consensual situations, mm -hmm. but that's not the case at all. They're going after yeah, that's not the case. Characters. Yeah, they're going after fiction characters. Uh, especially in Pixiv, we we are, uh, as far as I know, it's all artworks. Um. Well, I'm not sure if they have a cost. See, I might be wrong on that, but. I, I think they they're... have it's it's like a super 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 small percentage. But I don't think that's the big issue. I don't think it's not. It's not. The, they're not going after the cosplay creators. Mm -hmm. They're going specifically after the artwork creators. Exactly. Um, and I do believe that this will this will mark a a market change for where people will start hosting these things because I don't believe that you can fundamentally shut down a market like this unless yeah. it becomes illegal by law in every single country i don't think you shut down something like this and as far yeah, as i can't. know the governments already have a hard time enough following modern politics and modern issues i doubt that the government will move in any direction mm -hmm. so essentially this just means that patreon and pixiv will now be losing money you know that uh, at least pixiv since uh, they are japanese they probably show them the, the middle finger and you can kind of understand by the, their uh, response. Details of the restrictions. PayPal payments will no longer be available to support creators posting R18 content. But that they can do nothing about it. Uh, we sincerely apologize for any inconvenience this may cause to those wishing to use PayPal in the future and ask that you consider other payment methods. So really their point is kind of clear on this. We're doing this because we're being forced to, but yeah, if you want to pay with uh, other payment methods, feel free to do it. And uh, actually, we, we do recommend that you use other payment methods. When you're talking about the, the, the methods of payment in, in Pixiv, it can be hard sometimes to make payments overseas, even when right. it's digital goods. So uh, removing PayPal is not just using alternative methods. Mm -hmm. uh, it's actually PayPal is the easiest way to pay for kind of service. So it's a big hit for the creators. Right. 
it's not easy to just change the method that they're asking for money because a lot of people will just there'll be a big way for people to just not pay those that are already on the fence because mm -hmm. maybe some people will be thinking ah should i register for this artist or not should i and then they see that they can't pay by paypal that might be enough to dissuade them that is true yeah there's one more site that has also changed their policies relatively recently i think maybe seven days ago which is gumroad which is a lot of artists from pixiv were already migrating to gumroad to have more uh, unique pages and maybe have more unique payment options uh, and gumroad has recently come out and said that they no longer accept non-safe for work material in their website yeah, not only art, but also videos, also acted videos with uh, with real people, right? Yes. Although the title yes. says art. Yeah, and there might be another reason for this, which is there is a possibility like that Gumroad never intended non-safe for work material to be posted on their website. I think that's totally fair, but it's just hmm. one more place when they're going after these artists. Yeah, true. So my fear is that if there's enough pressure, maybe eventually every single one of these alternate websites uh, might start causing issues. And this makes me wonder if at what point won't you just see like some kind of cryptocurrency scam where people talk <laughs> about adult coin or something like that, where you can now just use the the, the blockchain to pay for these arts. Because I can kind of see it happen. I can kind of see it happen. Yeah. Uh, one other thing that uh, I see happening is if PayPal keeps spreading these um, these restrictions to content, not only to artists, but keep starting people, to keep starting either conservatives, either leftists, whatever, I wouldn't put past Elon Musk to create like a um, XPay or XPAL or uh, something like that. To be honest, I think that would be the smartest thing he ever did. Taking into yeah. consideration that he was part of the original PayPal team. It was, exactly. I don't think it would be that weird for him to do something like that. Now, I, don't I think know he already really... hinted that that is a possibility. With uh, connected with uh, with uh, Twitter, which is now X, um, he already hinted that he wants to do like a kind of an ecosystem with uh, lots of things connected, with uh, voice calls um with uh, possibly a browser in the future and using it for payments so i wouldn't put past it yeah i don't know if legally uh, elon musk is willing to go into that business because sometimes when you work in a company that like paypal for example you're forced to sign certain agreements where you won't be working in this in the future it doesn't mean right. that there's not some legal uh, loophole that allows him to do it mm -hmm. uh, because maybe if it's not him, maybe if someone else is CEO of Twitter and they decide to do it, then it's already out of Elon Musk's um, restrictions. And on top of that, Elon Musk is not right. a developer. So it's not like he'll be working directly. Well, supposedly he's not the, the CEO of Twitter anymore. He isn't, he isn't. He, he, he assigned someone else for that. Yeah. But you know, this, this makes me wonder, like, where do you draw the line where banks should or shouldn't accept payments or where? where uh, these services online should or shouldn't accept payment. Where where have we gone in humanity where suddenly PayPal can decide what's morally correct or not? Like, why are these payment services going out of their way to go after this kind of content? We're not talking about illegal acts. We're not talking about- Yeah, we're not. So uh, and this, why... this is a real issue. It is a real issue because at what point can PayPal, imagine, this is just a small topic. like. Imagine that PayPal now makes a, a move against paying for alcohol, mm -hmm. which is something that a lot of people like, right? A lot of people like drinks. Uh, mm -hmm. What if PayPal suddenly decides, you know, uh, most people now buy alcohol through the internet, the technical future, but I don't think that ridiculous. Um, and they decide, okay, we no longer allow payment for alcohol. So now PayPal gets to decide what's good for humanity or not, or what's good for society. Yeah. That's just bypassing the government, if you ask. It is. It is bypassing the government. And it seems like a real issue to me because, like, this is, this is in a certain way, this is kind of a discrimination, right? Because right. you're not allowed to limit services of your company uh, discriminating based on who the, who the person is. 
right? And that's totally fair. That's how it's supposed to be. But you, you see social media companies doing that all the time. But and you, you, you also yeah. see, uh, for example, Google doing that all the time. Uh, yeah. Over the last few years, Google has been censoring uh, more and more search results, which they call it fixing the algorithm or fixing the elections. Yeah, and I mean, it's a different a, kind of fixing, but there's a there's a, a Twitch streamer that I kind of like. I watch sometimes, but not always. Uh, he's called Des, and he's a pol he, he speaks a lot about politics and he's been banned from a lot of sites already. And he, he's a leftist, by the way. He's not a mm -hmm. right-wing uh, extremist, and he's not a left-wing extremist. He's a person. He's more turned towards the left, but he's very centered in his opinion. Right. And because he's so centered in his opinions, he sits on the fence on some things, and that has caused a lot of people to hate him and to report him to get him banned from very we from different websites, mm -hmm. even though he has not not said anything that would shock you or shock anyone. Like he just has his own opinions. He's not an extremist by any measure. Mm -hmm. He shuts down extremists a lot, and he's still been banned from Twitch and from other websites, as far as I know. And my question is, how far do you go with limiting free speech and the freedom to commerce and to make art? Like, how far does it go? Because in a certain way, when you're, when you're shutting down art, you are shutting down freedom of speech in a certain you way. You are, yeah. And... And for me, that's a big issue because it, it starts going into your, how do I say this? It becomes an issue because it starts going after the things you like and the things you agree with and the things you wish to change. But mm -hmm. it's not a natural progression of society. It's not like society got together and decided, okay, this is not right anymore. We're talking about very rich individuals with a lot of influence stepping up and saying, okay, we no longer want to allow this. We no longer want this to be part of society. Yeah, a lot of uh, unelected bureaucrats. Exactly. A lot of people with, how do I say, maybe too much time in their hands. Yeah. Going after things that they really shouldn't. Well, like you were saying, when you're attacking art, you're attacking freedom of speech. But all of this goes past it. Because when we have all these social media companies censoring people, Google changing the algorithm to, to favor certain sites, and all of that. You also have to keep in mind that one of the things that um, has been talked over the, the past few years and governments want to approve is central bank digital currency, where uh, they basically control everything you do. Put these things together and you can see that this is going to be a, a disaster. Yeah, because now you, you won't even be able to pay with physical money in the future if this keeps going this way. Yeah, I don't have an issue with not having physical payment. I have an issue with who's controlling the digital payment. And if it's yeah. centralized in one only individual or one entity, so to say. Uh, and the question is also, how much of the power are we giving to the government? And how much power are we giving to these companies? I think that's a serious issue. Because yeah, I, I mean, I have an issue with uh, the government knowing where I go to eat or what I buy uh, at the supermarket. I, I think the government shouldn't know those things. And well, if, if I don't want them that. to know those things that I pay with money, you already, with money, they already know that basically when you're showing them their VAT number, when you go to buy something, they already know right. what you make the money on a certain way. Europe. So that's, ba but that's a choice, right? You're not, that's a, cho a choice. Yeah. Yeah. And it, there's obviously financial incentives for you to do that. But unless mm -hmm. you're a company, you're not forced to get a VAT number. I think that's, a bigger issue because when you look back historically you had the separation of church and state mm -hmm. and at some point the church had a big control over the money in any given country in europe uh, so being in the right side with the with the religion would also help the monarch and there was a certain separation of church and state because there was this idea which is correct that your religious beliefs cannot control the populace they cannot be used to enforce um, politics onto the people. They're supposed to be two different things. So if you believe in any given religion, you should not be forced by the state to believe in it. They right. cannot be, they cannot shun you down because you believe in a different religion or don't believe in any religion. 
uh, this is also why you have the separation of the judicial and the executive powers. Mm -hmm. uh, but what you're seeing here is someone bypassing these restrictions and basically inputting their own religious or moral belief onto others by controlling the methods of payment. Exactly. And I do believe that's a serious issue because there should also be a separation between your personal moral opinions and the service that you're providing. I know that uh, there's a lot of people that are going to use the classic excuse, but they're a private company, they can do whatever they want, right? You've probably already heard the, that classic excuse. Yeah, I've heard that plenty of times. Yeah, my issue here especially is these private companies that uh, you say they can do whatever they want. Well, firstly, we know that uh, it's not exactly like that. There's rules that each country has and the companies do have to, to respect those rules. There, there is basic rules. And not only that, these big giant companies, they receive incentives from the state. So it's not as simple. Oh, they, they can do whatever they want. OK, then cut the financial incentives. They receive um, uh, benefits when it comes to taxes. OK, cut those benefits then. But if if you're anyone, going to use that uh, that excuse, does, does anyone want to use that excuse for PayPal though? As far as I know, PayPal. There's a lot of people that sadly use that excuse. Yeah. Yeah, but look, PayPal is owned by Amazon, and as far as I know, Amazon has some of the worst po work politics in the entire world. Right. So you do not want to be an Amazon employee. Simple as. Mm -hmm. You do not want to work in their warehouse, and don't you don't want to be working in their logistics. So why would you assume that the government and people should not have a word in how you treat your employees and also how you affect the society? Exactly. Because the companies are an entity in their, in, in their own. So you're basically saying that if you're rich, you can influence society however you want. Yeah. So, I mean, that to me, that feels like extreme capitalism. That feels like the kind of things that I'm against. And it also feels like the kind of thing that a lot of people, especially on the left, are against. Uh, so why would this? At least they used to be, because uh, I've seen the, this excuse being used by the left more and more over the past recent years, because uh, it's targeting more the other side. So yeah, so the the people on the left started using these excuses when you wanted to silence uh, political extremists, like people that had extremist ideas I could kind of see where it comes from because some of these could be argued legal legally so to say you could say oh, well these people are, are spreading hate speech and that's uh, illegal in this country and illegal in that country and so on I can see where that's coming from but they're not even coming for that they're coming for material that is legal where there is yeah. nothing in any country prohibiting these artworks from being produced and sold so why should a company decide what's good for you or not? Exactly. So what if one day you make all your payments, imagine you start buying all your food online through Amazon and suddenly Amazon decides, you know what? You've eaten too much calories. You've ordered too much things with potatoes, with sodium. Uh, you cannot eat more of this. You cannot eat more of that. Uh, we're prohibiting you from buying more of this product. For your own good. D we're don't give them ideas. Health. Don't give them no, ideas. I don't, I don't think we're so far away from that, this topic. We're not. Though. What we're talking about here is you already have your account on mm -hmm. Pixiv or Patreon or Gumroad. Yeah. And you sign for that. You follow their guidelines and suddenly PayPal starts pressuring the original website to lock your content. Yeah. The, that's my issue. Yeah, the, that's super scam. Because, you know, like if a social network has a, an agreement that you don't accept or you don't like, you're free to not use it. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, I don't use Facebook. I've erased my Facebook account over 10 years ago. Like, why are you forced to use Facebook? You're not. Right. But Facebook is not a, how do I say, a necessary service. Mm -hmm. You can live just fine without Facebook, regardless of what a lot of people think. In fact, right. I will go as far as to say you can, live, you can live just fine without being in any, any social Mm -hmm. so what i'm talking about here is when you have something that you have to sell online and you're following all the guidelines and suddenly paypal shows up or mastercard shows up and says i no longer want to be associated with this 
but who's associating it? Who's saying it's PayPal's fault that this artwork exists? Right. And that's what makes that's what confuses me. They, they should be independent when it comes to that. So you also want to talk something about Code Bakery, right? Right, 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 right. As I was saying, the game came out just today. Reverse Collapse Codename Bakery. This is a remake from an old game from Mika Team. I think they, they go by a, a different name uh, here. Uh, Mika Team are the developers of uh, Girls Frontline, which is their most popular title. If I'm not mistaken, their first title was uh, Reverse Collapse Codename Bakery by a different name. I don't exactly remember what was the, the original. As far as I know, that game was in China only, right? So it wasn't Chinese. You didn't have uh, I English official. I think so. I'm not 100% sure. But yeah, a lot of people have been uh, expecting this game. And um, from the looks of it, it looks pretty good. But there has been a controversy immediately day one. As you can see, the reviews are mixed. Like the game has, uh, has only just came out and it has already been review bomb. Why? Do you know why? Well, I think you, you should uh, tell us why because I'm not 100% sure. Yeah, I'm just going to, to read them. You may be confused about the common section of this game. Why are there so many reviews written in simplified Chinese with low gameplay duration? Let me briefly explain your doubts. This game is produced by a Chinese gaming company who had previously worked on three mobile games in a series. So uh, Girls Frontline, uh, Girls Frontline 2 and uh, Project Neurocloud. And in a recent sequel, they destroyed the character design of the previous installments on Girls Frontline 2. Uh, tearing apart the love and hope that players had always hoped for but refused to apologize and more blah 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 blah. So probably from hearing this if you're not uh, aware of the cons uh, you might think oh my god they must have done something terrible. What is so terrible that, that they did? So all of this controversy it's because of a character which is type 95 which is a, an uh, assault rifle from uh, Ooh, can Girls Frontline. Can you show the on YouTube? <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll show the, the, the full picture. This is a Chinese weapon, so uh, you can understand how this links to, to the Chinese. Uh, this is the, the full artwork. Uh, I'll show the, the censored artwork too. But it's not because of the censored artwork, by the way. Then what? All of this controversy. It's because uh, from Girls Frontline to Girls Frontline 2, there's a time skip period. Uh, by the way, Girls Frontline uh, hasn't even uh, reached the end of the story, but uh, we know there's going to be a, a time skip period. And um, during uh, that time skip, the private military company that uh, you serve on Girls Frontline has disbanded and many of the dolls have been wandering around. And uh, Type 95 during that time skip has been treated by a human and they hint on the backstory that they develop a romantic relationship. And that was it. There's nothing more. The Chinese absolutely lost their mind. They absolutely exploded just at this because it's a national rifle. This is an insult to, to China. But more than that, how could they do this to their favorite wife who I didn't even knew that uh, Type 95 was, was that popular because on the main story she barely shows up and that is if, if she even shows up I'm not even remembering on the main story itself that they specifically show her uh, she's not relevant at all and they completely lost their minds just because she might have uh, she might have a romantic relationship with uh, another human that it's not the commander it's Look, completely before, insanity. Before I comment on this, I must know, mm -hmm. was the romantic relationship with the human consensual? I mean, <laughs> I assume so. <laughs> I assume so. Because I don't want to be on the bad side of PayPal on this. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't want to, to get the, this podcast demonetized, so I, yeah. I'm assuming that, that there's, so, there's no tears, so... Uh, we, and she looks pretty for, happy. Yeah, we know for a fact that the Chinese players of gacha games like Girls Frontline and Genshin Impact, they have been very vocal about small changes in the game. 
uh, or small mm-hmm. changes in the character. They seem to have developed this very strong parasocial relationship with a with a lot of characters. And whenever I see something happening with a game from you know with their Chinese audience, it's always some ridiculous reason, something that comes out of left field completely. Something that uh, that uh, has been blown out of proportion, right? Yeah, completely. Like completely. Like, where do you put the, again the artistic freedom to write the story as you want? Right. So, I think these people should seriously think about their personal lives and think: Do I really care this much about a fictional girl and her fictional relationships? And it's kind of weird because, as you know, China uh, censors a lot of characters on, on their games. On um, yeah. we talked about that. Uh, on our first podcast on uh, about Genshin Impact, how they, they censored yeah. some of the characters. Uh, they also censored characters. Uh, they also censored many characters on uh, Girls Frontline, which I, I told last podcast. Uh, Mika team, uh, basically, when it comes to the international, they basically said, well, it will be a shame if um, if someone uh, spreads the uncensor code. It will be a shame. So China censors a, a lot of characters and these companies are forced to obey. But you never see, or barely ever see, the Chinese get offended with that. They direct their rage to the most strange things possible. Yeah, I remember. I'm not big on the B, on the whole VTuber scene, but I mm-hmm. do remember there was this big VTuber from Japan that got in a lot of issues because she was reading statistics from YouTube, I believe, or mm-hmm. or Twitch. I'm not sure, and. She said, oh, we have so XX people from uh, China and we have so, so many people from uh, Taiwan. Mm-hmm. And that blew out of proportion. She was fired from her company. And she oh, I heard to... about it. Yeah. Yeah. And Japanese VTubers, I believe, were completely forbidden from acting in China. Just because of that small incident. But it was also a case of public outrage. The people, the fans themselves in China yeah. were completely outraged by this. And the only thing I can... T- say about this really is it's not my country but chill out man like there are more concerning issues in the world and i'm not just saying that you can't be invested in your fictional character but i do believe that this is such a small issue it's not even an issue. it is it is it's not even an issue like what, what's going th- on here? that's not even the worst case you could imagine that uh, uh, someone being fired and losing their job because because of that that will be like one of the worst cases, nor, not even close. There has been examples, especially related to Genshin Impact, because Chinese Genshin fans, I criticize a lot uh, the international Genshin fans, and I have a lot of reasons for that. But even those, somehow, they pale in comparison to Chinese Genshin fans. They're Why insane. Do you think this is- why, why do you think this is? Why do you think the Chinese response is so strong? I, I don't know. Because you've seen um, you've seen a lot of insane things when it comes to English fans. A lot of uh, often hinge bullshit. Uh, for example, they are extreme defense of uh, oil wars. I don't know if I told this on uh, on past live streams, but they basically defend the company with the teeth and nails. Uh, because every... I've also I've also seen them complaining about Mihoyo for things like uh, a desert character is not tan enough, or she's not dark skinned enough for some people's taste. I've seen stuff. Yeah, like that. yeah, that, that that also happens when it comes to the slightest bit of racism or implied racism. They immediately complain, but everything else they will defend the company to the limit. That same character, when they released it as the worst five star in the game by far, and one of the the worst uh, characters in the game, they immediately jumped just to to defend the company. No, no, no! You're the one that that uh, that are complaining without any reason. They're doing everything right, and they attack the people that were rightfully so, uh, complaining that the character sucked, and uh, that they're not even uh, fixing the bugs. So. You have English fans being super white knights. You also have already heard about probably uh, Japanese fans, especially when it comes to things related to idols, also acting on uh, unhinged ways and um, 
and stalking people. You probably already heard that. Yeah, I've heard about that, especially in Japan. It happens a lot. As yeah, like that happens a lot in Japan. But the Chinese fans' uh, response to minor things, it's like completely blown out of proportion, even when we're comparing with these two. I, yeah, I don't know why it is. I don't know if it's like the way their society is built or maybe the issues that they have socially. It might be. They might be blending out to the games as a form of escapism. And then they're they're using the game as an excuse to vent out their frustration. Mm -hmm. Maybe they have a terrible life and they decide, you know what? This is what really matters. I care about this character's yeah. relationship with another fictional character. But I've seen, for example, in the Western audience, I've seen a case in Genshin Impact of an entire Discord server that basically would ban anyone that would post uh, heterosexual artwork of a certain, uh, I think it was a male character or a female character, or maybe it was Honkai Impact. There was basically this character that the... Even Pro though it's probably it was Genshin. It was never shown in the game, but basically they, they want to hint that the character might be lesbian, and the fans don't want her to be depicted with any of the male characters kissing or holding each other. Like, they just ban that outright and they ban Yeah, it. It, by what you're describing, it's, it's probably Genshin, because Genshin has a lot of uh, non heterosexual fanships. So, yeah, yeah, it's probably Genshin. But that's very weird, right? Because, again, it is a fictional character and they're fictional characters in a fictional game. You're not, you know, you're not even changing the game by making an artwork of it. Uh, like people have been shipping each other, like in fictional stories, all the time. Sometimes you ship the main character with the main villain, uh, and people yeah. have not had issues with this in the past. So I don't know why we're suddenly seeing this huge outrage. I don't know if people maybe are spending too much time playing these games. Probably. I don't know, I don't know if maybe they're too invested in something like this. But I can't see this as being a healthy thing. It's not. Like when you're spending this much time thinking about a fictional character, you've seen like the memes, right? You've seen people yeah. with like anime characters all over their their room in posters and stuff, and then they mm -hmm. have a, a body pillow with their favorite character and they act like, oh yeah, this is my my waifu. This is the character I really love. I think that's that's crossing a lot of barriers. And it's like you can say it doesn't really matter uh, because it's not affecting anyone else. And that's true when it comes right. to the Western fan. But it's clearly affecting other people in the Chinese fans if they're going out of their way to actually harm people and animals to prove a point. Exactly. Like, okay, you, you, you always said otakus, but this is not the problem. I mean, okay, the, the problem with uh, with many attacks is they're going out of the way to annoy other people. But uh, this is not the main issue here. The the main issue, uh, especially related to this example, you're review bombing a, a game that has come out today that uh, it's not exactly the same title because of another continuation of a uh, title you liked that came out only in China. Like... You're the privileged ones, because you have early access to, to the game. The romantic relationship of that character doesn't affect you at all. It's, it's stated on uh, some bio or something like that. And you're review bombing a game because of that character that isn't even an important character on the main game. It's a complete level of insanity. Yeah, but I mean, I, I think review bombing is relatively... How do I say? It's not the worst of things because it never changes. Every game, like every game lately has been review bombed for the most uh, random. I don't think this yeah. is a big hit for the company. And the Chinese in specific, like I've seen the Chinese complaining, like completely review bombing games because they had bad single by right. Chinese translations. Uh, many games on right. Steam have had issues with review bombing Chinese. Uh, for things that sometimes don't make a lot of sense. Like sometimes it's just one bad, badly translated word or maybe they said something that is not politically correct in China. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's enough for you to get review bombed by the Chinese. The issue is that people don't take the Chinese review bombing seriously anymore because they already know they're unstable individuals. Right. Uh, and this is not me trying to hate on China. Like, for the love of God, I have plenty of love for the Chinese. But mm -hmm. there's clearly a big issue when it comes to, to Gacha games. And I've heard too many stories of, even in the West, people spending tens of thousands of dollars to get whatever characters they want in Gacha. Yeah, that happens a lot. 
for me, that's really, really weird because it is just a game, right? It is just a fictional yeah. character. Like, if you don't get the character you want, you could just try again when the next pre-roll comes, or maybe you spend exactly. $10 or $20, like, but spends of thousands of dollars, not only to get the character you want, but to get many Back when I characters. played Fate Grand Order, I remember hearing stories about, uh, well, it's usually all as Americans because uh, they also usually receive the most money compared to other countries. People spending like over 10k dollars or in some cases over 100k dollars on a game yeah. which had like the worst uh, gacha rates possible. And on Genshin, that also happens. I've already heard stories about that. Yeah, and many of these people are doing that to get the best status that they can on the characters, which is also weird because I know people that play the game completely for free and have beaten all the end yeah. content, end game content. So you're not forced to get these raids. Yeah, for example, with Fate Grand Order, there's not even PvP. And same with Genshin Impact. So... Yeah, but... Like, for example, I rem I used to play this MMO when it came out called Lost Ark. Mm -hmm. And it's a decent game. I don't I don't have much to say on it. Like, I think it has a big problem with the way that the level up system works, the way you build up your character and you evolve your gear. But I've seen people that spent over $50,000 on that game have the best gears possible. Uh, and they just trivialize the game completely. Now the game is way too easy for them. And then they complain, right. now the game is too easy for me. So why did you do it? Exactly. Like, you basically went out of your way to spend a ton of money on things that you probably shouldn't have, which the money could probably have been better spent elsewhere. Uh, and now you're complaining that the game is not catered to you? Yeah. So, for me, the same thing with Gachi. Then I do think gacha games are, are a big issue and I do have some moral issues with gacha because for me they're essentially legalized casinos where you're not even getting your money back ever. Right. So that's my opinion. I know that you're a, you probably disagree with me because you're a big gacha game player. No, not gacha exactly. Games. Not exactly. I don't completely disagree with you. Although I usually don't, don't spend a lot. And definitely, I don't spend more than uh, I would allow myself to lose. Yeah, so... but even, even then, like any money you're putting into a gacha game is money you're losing because you're never seeing that money. But I mean, you could you say the same, the same thing about any game that you buy skins. Although I understand why you're talking about gacha specific in this case, because you're it's basically gambling true. on... Yeah, it's not true because when you're paying for a skin in a game, First, it depends on the money, because some games right. are straight up uh, scamming you with the prices they put on them. <coughs> Ubisoft! <coughs> yeah, Blizzard. Um, yeah. But in even Final Fantasy XIV, they sell some skins. Well, they're not skins, they're cosmetics, but a lot of them don't are not worth the money you're paying for. But when you're paying for, for a skin, you know what you're getting. There's no right. half chance that you're not getting that skin. You're getting specifically mm -hmm. that. So... You can think of it as an exchange, but when you're playing a gacha game, you're always losing unless it's the first thing that, that you wanted that comes out of the of mm -hmm. the of the roulette. Because if you want something in specific and you roll 100 times, it comes out the 100th time, you lost those 99 times. Right. Unless it's the first roll that you do, it comes out, you're always losing. It's just mm -hmm. a net negative because the other things you're getting on the way are not useful for or you don't care for them. Or, or like, unless like, unless um, you're buying like a promotion with the, with the guaranteed role or something like that. Um, for example, uh, with the... Yeah, I guess, I guess you can say that when you have uh, guaranteed roles on like... Yeah, but, but uh, we, then, had, we had that on uh, the Machi Memory Freeze, which I used to play. Uh, yeah, but even then, I, still, peace. I still think that's a scam because it still goes back to... If you roll, imagine 100 times you have a guaranteed character drop that you want. Mm -hmm. But my issue with that, with that, is that you're way over overpaying for that one skin that you want. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like so I know, I know, I know. Back to me saying if you're in, in the case that I'm saying, it was different because they basically had packs which um, you had a ticket which was a guaranteed roll. So yeah. you're basically paying for at least that character. Uh, on that uh, role, imagine you're yeah, playing. Much, okay, it's a, it's a guaranteed 10 role. Uh, you're going yeah, to but... to get this specific character. Yeah, but uh, how much money are you getting? Are you spending on that? 
back then that was like five euros okay that's not too offensive I'd yeah say. but that, that one the the prices were uh, were really low yeah uh, it was also easy to to end up spending a lot because of that yeah but and it also wasn't a very popular game either so yeah it, it wasn't it, it wasn't it could go way too overboard mm -hmm. because there are a few games i know with gotcha gotcha mechanics that make prices low because they don't have enough people supporting the game. right right they made prices high no one mm -hmm. even play but that uh, but but, so, but with girls frontline one of the things that, that i really love is that it's different from the usual gacha model okay you can pay for resources which yeah. i don't know anyone that does because after more than a year of playing i maxed out my resources yeah i literally maxed out my resources which is something that uh, that it's virtually impossible let's imagine like the max uh, gems that you could have on genshin impact it will be like 999,999. Yeah, yeah basically it's, it's I, I have that. Yeah, but on Girls Frontline it's not the same thing at all. Uh, because yeah, it, if you're paying for resources, like it's just a hidden gacha because you still have to roll for the character with resources. And if you tell me that you need to play for a whole year to get somewhere decent with the game... Oh, I not even think, close. Not even yeah, close. After think, a year? Think, I've, played Genshin, I've played Genshin Impact and I've played Girls Frontline mm -hmm. and I feel like Girls Frontline is a lot more aggressive with their payment method than... Genshin. Because no, Genshin not, not even close, because you you don't no. need to pay for resources at all. No, but the problem is that you're basically saying that if you play Genshin Girls Line, if it was a second job, that you don't need to pay for it, that you are paying with with hours of... You are paying with your time. That's not, that's not just not what you're understanding. And if you want to say, I don't mm. have anything better to do with my time, sure, go with that. But it's still a big issue, because Girls Frontline's gameplay in-game loop is not that good it's just not that good objectively it's not that good of a game like, i mean can, i, I, I can't can disagree say, sure you can disagree but you'd be wrong on that <laughs> <laughs> let me let me just explain why like the sure. game loop for you to get to those resources you have to repeat a lot of missions that are just either idle missions or you have to repeat missions that you already done before to get specific resources you have to do you can farm my fk yeah but Farming AFK is still doing something. Like, why are you? Why are I'm not in favor of AFK mechanics in objectively bad gameplay mechanics. Sorry, I mean you can literally send expeditions overnight or something, and you will yeah, get a bunch of resources. You do, you do while you're that. not even uh, online. Sure, but you do understand that that's a game mechanic that someone came up with. Yeah, sure. To incentivize you to pay for more resources. It's not something that's a net positive for the game. Because Again, I don't I know you, anyone that pays for uh, actual resources. I can guarantee you that if Girls Frontline is having a sequel and mm -hmm. they're making these side games and they have more than one spin-off, I can guarantee you that, that, you that they're making bank on this. Someone out there is paying. So you might not know them personally, but I also don't know a lot of people that play Girls Frontline in real life. On res resources, it's probably an absolute rarity. Uh, most of their money comes uh, from, scale, uh, from selling skins. Yeah, and you're also forgetting that those skins are gacha mechanics. Like you're straight up paying for gachas for the skin. Like some, skins some you can pay directly, are, some are not. But some are gacha, so you can't just yeah. say Girls Frontline does it better because for me, Girls Frontline is way more obnoxious on their monetization than Genshin Impact, and I'm, I don't even like Genshin Impact. I, mm -hmm. I much prefer Girls Frontline, and I still think that it's much more aggressive. Genshin Impact, they just do a better job at hiding. Because at the end of the day, you're still just an NPC staying in front of your phone, replaying the same mission over and over again, sending some AFK uh, squads to do the mission for you. It's but just you, you forget that, uh, especially when it comes to time, on Genshin Impact, you're basically farming twice. You pay for the resources, for the gems, and then you still have to spend, uh, mind you, a lot more time leveling up those characters and getting uh, every resource to, to level up those characters. Yeah, but he here's the big difference, though. Here's the big difference. You're not forced to overlevel the your characters to progress with the main story. You are indeed forced to le overlevel your character to see with girls. You have to have very specific sets of characters and very specific sets of stats to be able to able to overcome some issues in girls. More or less. No, you are. In fact, like if you want to do the night missions, you have to have very specific sets of gears and very specific. Uh, uh, team layouts to be able to do them. That's just a fact. Yeah, that, that to do. 
Yeah, so for me, that's a big issue because if I want to do the entire Genshin Impact storyline, the main storyline, without talking about endgame content, mm -hmm. I don't need to farm that much. I can uh, yeah, just... do. No, not really. You know, for a fact, people that just jump into Genshin Impact occasionally, mm -hmm. that basically finish the story and they stop playing and they come back when the new story is up and they don't grind at all. And they still progress with the story, so... You need specific adventure ranks to level up certain characters and those adventure ranks, at one point you, you're going to have to grind. There's like no way around it, even if you do sure, like not... all of the content from the main but story, you're do still... You really, do you really want to compare the level of grind that you have to do there with the level of grind that you have to do in Girls Frontline? Yes, because I played both and I remember yeah. I spent a lot more time leveling up my characters but on Genshin Impact. Them. But you level them more than you needed. That's what I'm saying. You level. I, I needed to to get to that more. adventure rank, so I, I could unlock the next quest. Do you seriously think that it's really that hard to advance the next adventure rank? It's not. Compared to the grind you have to do on Girls Frontline, it's not that hard. No, I, I, I disagree. Because in Girls Frontline, your progress is also directly tied to random. To random? Yeah, to randomness, to what characters you manage to produce with your manufacturer. While in, Girl, in Genshin Impact, it's very straightforward. They you already give you level. some of the best characters for free. Not the ones that you need for the night missions, though. But the night missions are optional. They're part of the story, though. Like, there's not much to do in the game. That's what I'm saying. Like, But uh, let in, me just say one thing. Impact, you have an entire open world to go around and explore. In Girls Frontline, you're repeating the same tactical missions over and over again that you have to follow an online guide to get the top rank because they're so limited in the scope of what you can be doing. I mean, if you want to get the, the top rank, for sure, yeah, but which, which Genshin good, doesn't have the exact... Very good for your resources and characters that you can get, and you know that for a fact. I mean, it, it helps a bit. You have to see that I'm talking about the, the point of someone that has maxed out resources, and I didn't spend a, a single cent on resources. Yeah, and uh, talking, at this point, point of I have of like... Top. 10 characters missing from uh, all of the, yeah, the dolls mean, on the gacha. How long have you been playing in Girls? For about a year. A year? More than that. Uh, I started on... Uh, I think you it was October 2022. Two years ago. Yeah, so we're in 2024. Yeah. So you started... It was a uh, year and a half, basically. Yeah, year and a half, sure. Mm -hmm. That's a lot, of a lot of time and now you've been playing basically without pauses almost. Um, I'm talking about the point of view of a, of a casual player because if I stopped playing I, I stopped playing Girls Frontline a long time ago mm -hmm. if I start playing now again yeah. I need to grind to get to that next mission I know people that stop playing against an impact they come back when the next story missions drop and they can just do them they have to do very minimal grind maybe they grind for a week and they're there if you tell me that I need to, to do a bunch of specific achievements like I do in Girls Frontline and that I have to grind that out to be able to get to the current mission, that's crazy. That's just crazy. Like I said, the night missions are optional. You said they are part of the main story. Well, not exactly. But they are well, even they are less part, part of the main story. All that's... of them happen at the same time. Like, a lot of them add additional context to what's happening. The, the night ones, not exactly. The emergency ones, yeah, the emergency are part of the main story. Yeah, but the, the night ones, not exactly. Are not, are not as hard as the, the night ones. Yeah, so the, the night you, ones at the beginning can, can be a bit hard, but... But even if you remove, even if you remove the night missions, starts. I got yeah. soft-locked on, on the story mode because I had to do a lot of grinding to proceed as a casual player, as someone that doesn't have eight hours a day to play girls frontline to be constantly checking my phone repeating but AFK what me. what exactly did you get stuck on well i don't remember the 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 number of the mission but i remember very specifically that i needed to get more members in each of my units i need to get more more dolls in more dummy dolls links yeah, yeah yeah more dummy links uh, um, i remember that to get that yeah. i needed a lot of resources that i didn't have yeah, I don't remember having uh, an issue that that's just well, what I'm telling you. Well, you didn't have an issue because you were following guidelines online. Yeah. And to me, that's way too much work. Like, why do True. I have to go out of my way to read a guide to be able to proceed with the main story? It doesn't make sense. I never had to do that in Genshin Impact. And True. I don't know anyone that does that in Genshin Impact. Yeah, I don't see people following 
uh, guides online to be able to advance to the next story mission. I mean, Genshin Impact is pretty easy, especially on the overworld. Uh, well, sometimes have... too easy. Is Girls Frontline easy? Girls Frontline is not hard. You just have to grind. Like, that's not a hard game. And if you tell me that you have to follow a guide to get the best of ranks, that's not even hard. You're bypassing the difficulty. You can think about the idea in your head. Yeah, it's just that, do that do sometimes do that? it's pretty hard. I did that with uh, a lot of the missions because I tried yeah, to get some some all the medals in one mission. Yeah, some of, some of the missions you can do that, but a lot of the missions have such specific ways that the developer wanted you to run that mission that you can't fail by a single turn. And it's really hard to decide, okay, because a lot of them have to do with the way the AI is going to decide the next turn, where they're going to go, mm -hmm. what house they're going to occupy. And sometimes the AI can just fail and do something else. So you're already locked right. out of a medal from a decision that you had no power in. Right. You're locked out of, of achieving the best score possible because of something the AI did, not because of a decision you as a player did. So as in, there's no better option for you to uh, run that. The decision. case that you're describing is actually pretty specific. It, it doesn't happen a lot, but it is true. It happens, it happens on, on some for, cases. It happens enough for me to have an issue with it. On the beginning, if I remember right, in none of the cases, it locks you from having the best rank. It, it does. might... On, like third, on the first hmm. chapter, in like mission three or four, there's a specific case where the only way for you to get the best medals, or maybe it's mission two, I'm not sure. The best way for mm -hmm. you to get the medals is to use AI-controlled... Friend uh, Echelon. Balls. Hmm? Friend Echelon. Yeah, to use the Friend Echelons and to use the, yeah. the, the ones that the game itself gives you as Friend Echelon. Right. And the way that the AI from the enemy side works is based on the position of those echelons. But there is a small chance that even then they'll decide to go the wrong way and you basically just threw the mission. There's nothing mm -hmm. you can do to get the medal. I don't think that's good design. I think that's terrible design. Like, it, it's a, a, a game as simple as get, Girls Frontline should not have this. Because it's not even difficulty. You're just basically throwing a, a coin into the air whether you're going to get all the medals or not. That's usually why the guides do recommend. Yeah, but again, off. you're talking about guides. So for yeah. me, you already threw the game away by saying you have to follow a guide. And if no, that, what I'm what I'm end. saying is that that's why not only the guides, but most people recommend that you get the bronze and the gold medal on one mission, and then on the next one uh, get the silver medal. I did, however, not follow the guide when it comes to that, and uh, came up sometimes with a few ways of getting all three medals. But most of the times, it's actually impossible by design to get all three in the same position. Yeah, which, I mean, I don't think that's terrible. I'm not talking about getting all the the, the medals at the same. Mm -hmm. I think that's okay that you have to replay it sometimes to get all the medals. I don't think that's a big issue. But uh, it does come to me as a problem when based on your... You can't get the, the gold medal based on your decision alone. It's all it, There's also a random element. Yeah, like I said, I know it happens. Yeah, and big issue. So for me, it just piles a lot of grind and a lot of randomness onto a game that does not have the right to be like that. Because fundamentally, Girls Frontline is just a game where you're throwing numbers against other numbers. There's nothing else to it. There's no personal skill involved. You have the set of really strong characters and that's it. So saying that Genshin Impact is super easy compared to Girls Frontline that's not even the truth. It just happens that Genshin Impact, Genshin Impact is more convenient. That's all there is to it. But it's also pretty easy. Yeah, I don't think Genshin Impact is particularly hard. On the overworld, hard. especially. Yeah, I don't think it's particularly hard. But again, it is a gacha game. So I don't expect high standards. That's why I don't play it at all. <laughs> I played it when it came out for a while. And then I stopped. And then I played Girls Frontline for a bit. And then I stopped. I tried getting back into Girls Frontline. And I couldn't. Because the way, like, you can say if you follow all these guidelines and get all these achievements, you can get the necessary resources, but that's not, how do I, how do I say this? I don't want to play a game to be told how to play the game. Right. I want to play a game, I want to experience it myself without having to look up things online. And the moment I have to do that, the game lost. It's, it's just that simple. If I wanted to play on Excel, I can just open Excel right now and start typing random things. And that's my problem with with the gacha games in general. A lot of them just follow this. As you know, like Honkai Impact is even worse than this. 
Actually, I'm not aware of that. Uh, Monkey in... Star Rail, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm not aware of that because I haven't played Honkai Star Rail. Maybe yeah, well, you can. I know some people that play Honkai Star Rail mm -hmm. and they complain that the game soft locks you from advancing based on time. Like you are forced to just spend a lot of time doing idle stuff. Well, not even idle stuff, but just doing meaningless stuff that no one cares for just to get a specific item. And I, I just think I just don't think that's good game design. It's not appealing. But for the main story, for uh... Well, I do think there was a moment in in the main story where that happens, but there's also side content like that. But again, mm. like, Honkai Star Wars doesn't have a lot of content. In it. So you are going to do the side story. Right. Like, when I'm talking about Genshin Impact, there's a lot you can do without getting into any hard trials or things that need grinding mm -hmm. because you have all the exploration aspect of it. Right? Right. Like you can just go around and play with the open world. Mm-hmm find small small snippets of story or gather collectibles or just go on an adventure like there's a lot more to it than just a number game you know what i mean right right yeah that's it <laughs> oh by the way i was talking about the game that the codename bakery was based on the original one i think it's this one codename bakery girl yeah i think it was the first one that they did is a stretchy RPG game developed by my Mika team in partnership with Game Master and Vanguard Sound, released for PC in China. Yeah, in China. On yeah. 9 March 2013. Yeah, they don't talk about any international release, so it might have been uh, only released in China. Yeah, it says so in the, in the last uh, paragraph there. It says, Codename Bakery Girl can be considered reimagining of the 2009 visual novel. Girl oh, right. Just despite changing almost past recognition, the story structure is very similar. Uh, Codename Bakery Girl will itself receive a remake titled, bringing it to international markets. So basically, it used to be in China only. Yeah, uh, but th this is a remaster of the Codename Bakery Girl, which yeah. is an adaptation of the Girl of the Bakehouse, which is this yeah. one. So I never actually saw this visual. I don't know if you're aware of it. This visual? No, I never saw it. Yeah. Is it also made by Mika? The visual novel? I think so. I think so. Yeah. Yeah, made it's by Mika team, game. exactly. It's a connected visual. That might be nice to play. Mm hmm So that was probably the first game, like the visual novel. Yeah, and then uh, I think they became a bit more popular with uh, Codename Bakery Girl, because, you know, usually the visual novels at the beginning are not that popular until they, they receive a, any other kind of adaptation. And a few years later they released Girls Frontline, then Project Neuro Clouds, then Girls Frontline 2, and now Codename Bakery. And that's where we are. 